Security experts say there's no proof that the Islamic State ordered the Manchester attack. We'll have the latest on the investigation. A youth robotics contest in Senegal promotes innovation for African economic growth. And cell phone giant Nokia goes old school with its latest relaunch. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory and this is Africa 54. Now, British police say they have arrested three more people in connection with the investigation into Monday's deadly bombing in Manchester. Authorities say the arrests came after officers executed warrants in South Manchester. The Islamic State terror group claims that one of its soldiers carried out the attack. Police have identified the suspected suicide bomber as 22-year-old Salman Abedi, a British citizen of Libyan descent. VOA's Sladitsa Hoke reports. Mourners gathered outside the city hall in Manchester Tuesday to hold a vigil for the victims of the bombing that happened at the end of an Ariana Grande concert. This latest in a series of terrorist attacks in Europe took place amid reports of Islamic State's military losses in Iraq and Syria. Military officials predict imminent recapture of the militant strongholds in Mosul and Raqqa, and with that, the demise of the group's so-called caliphate. But U.S. intelligence officials say despite its dwindling power, Islamic State continues to inspire terror. We assess ISIS will continue to be an active terrorist threat to the United States due to its proven ability to direct and inspire attacks against a wide range of targets around the world. Dan Coates, director of U.S. national intelligence, says Islamic State claims responsibility for virtually every terrorist attack in Europe, but the connection is not always clear. Security analysts say some of the terrorists have had direct connections with Islamic State, but many have not. I think that the, uh, to, to, to delineate with 100% certainty is, is, is difficult to discern at this point, but I, I think that that's emblematic of how the threat's changed, how it's metastasized. It's not just Baghdadi in Syria calling the shots in, in Iraq, but you also uh, have those that are inspired and are going to act when and where they can. Security expert Frank Silufo told VOA that Britain's security service is among the best in the world, but it cannot prevent every attack. You're never going to be in a position, at least in open democracies, to protect everything, everywhere, all the time, from every perpetrator and every modality of attack. Silufo says a military defeat of Islamic State is likely to increase a short-term terror threat in Europe and elsewhere, because the fighters displaced from Syria and Iraq will return to their countries of origin and continue to act there. He said countries must devise strategies to undermine their ideology that fuels terrorism. Zlatica Hoek, VOA News, Washington. U.S. President Donald Trump has arrived in Brussels on Wednesday, but not before meeting with Pope Francis at the Vatican. The two men, meeting for the first time, shook hands before sitting down in the Pope's private study. After the President's private meeting with the Pope in the Apostolic Palace, there was a brief expanded audience for the other members of the U.S. delegation, including First Lady Melania Trump, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson, and Trump's daughter Ivanka. Later, during a meeting with Italian Prime Minister Paolo Gentiloni, Trump described meeting the Pope as a great honor. He is something. He is really good. We had a fantastic meeting and we had a fantastic tour. It was really beautiful. Doing, uh, we're liking Italy very much. The Prime Minister, everybody. But we're liking Italy very, very much. Uh, and it was an honor to be with the Pope. Well, on Thursday, President Trump uh, is scheduled to meet King Felipe and Queen Matilda at the Royal Palace in Brussels. Now, here in the United States, congressional probes into Russian election interference showed no signs of letting up. Even as special counsel Robert Mueller launches a wide-ranging ranging Justice Department investigation, President Trump's reported uh, demands to top leadership of U.S. intelligence agencies to deny there was any collusion between his campaign and Russia dominated Tuesday's intense day of congressional testimony. Here's VOA's Catherine Gibson. 
An intense day of questions on Capitol Hill, and for once, a few answers about the Trump campaign and Russia. I encountered and am aware of information and intelligence that um, revealed contacts and interactions between Russian officials and U.S. persons involved in the uh, Trump campaign that um, I was concerned about because of known Russian efforts to suborn the, such individuals. And it uh, raised questions in my mind, again, whether or not the Russians were able to gain the cooperation of those individuals. The man who led the nation's top spy agency last year said he warned Russia about its brazen interference in the 2016 election, an effort that included recruitment of campaign officials. Frequently, individuals who go along that treasonous path do not even realize they're along that path until it gets to be a bit too late. A path that will be even harder for investigators to sort out after Trump's former national security adviser Michael Flynn declined to give incriminating testimony, which is his constitutional right. Flynn's case is a key piece of the Russia puzzle, and one that Brennan told lawmakers was ultimately up to law enforcement to decide. Brennan's testimony came just hours after reports President Trump asked two top U.S. intelligence officials to publicly deny collusion with Russia, a charge one of them would not address during Senate testimony. I don't feel it's appropriate to characterize uh, discussions and conversations with the president. Coates told senators he steered clear of political considerations and was deeply concerned by leaks of classified information, prompting a challenge from one senator. If the president held any other position in our government, what he told the Russians could be considered the mother of all leaks. Was it dangerous for the president to share that classified information with the Russian government? Coates told Congress travel abroad had kept him from talking to the president about those Oval Office revelations. Just one of many concerns that will fuel congressional investigations moving forward, even as special counsel Robert Mueller begins his own investigation. Catherine Gibson, VOA News, Capitol Hill. Now more tragedy on the Mediterranean Sea. At least 34 migrants, most of them toddlers, drowned on Wednesday as Coast Guard boats and other vessels tried to save hundreds of others packed into boats off the coast of Libya. The Italian Coast Guard commander says a group of boats enlisted suddenly, sending about 200 people tumbling into the sea. And the Coast Guard uh, called in more ships to help with the rescue, saying about 1,700 people were packed into about 15 vessels. More than 1,300 people have died this year on the world's most dangerous crossing for migrants fleeing poverty and war across Africa and the Middle East. In the past week, more than 7,000 migrants have been plucked from unsafe boats in the international waters off the western coast of Libya. Well, now, NATO leaders are gathering in Brussels for Thursday's summit, expecting to agree on the key principles. With Monday's attack in Britain overshadowing the meeting, there is likely to be quick consensus on the need to keep fighting terrorism both at home and abroad. VOS Luis Ramirez reports from Brussels. The war in Afghanistan is one of the key topics European leaders hope to learn more about when they meet with U.S. President Donald Trump. The U.S. leader wants a boost in NATO contributions for the war effort. But Germany's Angela Merkel has indicated she is lukewarm about this and will wait for NATO discussions on the matter. We are also coordinating the cooperation of about 20 member countries which are active there. I'm going to wait for the decisions. I do not think we're first in line to expand our capacities there. Aside from the Afghanistan war, Trump has made clear he wants members to meet minimum contributions and spend 2 percent of their gross national income on defense. European leaders expect to hear a reaffirmation that NATO's anti-terrorism work extends beyond Europe and the Atlantic. Now, it is a vehicle for the world, actually. It is a, a, a global entity. And I think there is a case for expanding that now to dealing with ISIS. Now, I know this is controversial, but I think if it's approached carefully and steadily, we will see NATO accepting that it's right for there to be an extension of the remit from 
uh, Iraq to go out and to dealing with ISIS. And I think it's a much better way of American power being globally used within the framework of NATO. Russia also looms large for European leaders at both the NATO summit and the G7 meeting that follows in Italy. Germany, Austria and others hope for a new direction in relations with Moscow following the Ukraine crisis as continued sanctions against Russia have created pressure on Western European nations dependent on Russian energy exports. The big hope among European leaders is that seeing Trump face to face and hearing him repeat assurances that he no longer believes NATO is obsolete will quell anxieties about the U.S. role as the guarantor of Europe's security. NATO sources say officials may hold off on issuing a formal declaration as is common after some summits. It may depend on what is said at the meetings. In this time of transition and surprises, that is something no one can predict. Luis Ramirez. VOA News, Brussels. Well, the new head of the World Health Organization voiced hope on Wednesday that bipartisan support will prevail in the U.S. Congress to fund global health initiatives despite deep budget cuts proposed by the Trump administration. Tedros Adhano Ghebreyesus, a former Ethiopian health and foreign minister, elected as the first African WHO Director General on Tuesday, says the United Nations Agency will be seeking a new, new donors. The new chief succeeds outgoing Margaret Chan, who has been the WHO Director General since January 2007. Yesus begins his five-year term on July the 1st. Now, for more insight on the new WHO uh, chief, I'm joined by VOA digital journalist Salem Salomon. Hello, Salem. Thanks for having me. Now, first, uh, you know, it was a big day for Africa to have uh, the very first person, for first African to be appointed to this position, elected actually. But what is the significance about Dr. Tedros Wayne here? Well, he is the first African uh, to ever hold this position, so that's very significant in that way. Um, he comes from a developing country, uh, and even during his campaign, he was talking about a personal story that drives what he says, his passion. Uh, when he was young, he lost uh, a brother, uh, uh, seven year, years old, uh, uh, preventable, uh, uh, from a preventable disease, possibly uh, uh, measles. And that uh, has, a, you know, that experience of loss um, is what comes uh, yeah. as lack of access to health care uh, due to poverty uh, related. So that, that perspective is unique and important it's kind of it can relate you know so it's a very personal here so hopefully it can relate with uh, uh, the thousands of others who need urgent health care mm -hmm. but his campaign was very heated especially towards the end why was this the case and we know that uh, many ethiopians in the diaspora especially were not so happy about his election that's right you know, he's a very well-known figure uh, in, in, uh, in Ethiopia's politics. He's served as the Minister of Health, and he's also served as a foreign minister in the political uh, formation of, of the country. And so uh, he was accused, this campaign, this whole campaign was run like a political campaign, if you've seen, especially at the end of it, it got a little bit messy. Uh, accusations of cover-up of cholera epidemic during his term as a health minister uh, surfaced uh, three uh, epidemics in Ethiopia uh, uh, where he allegedly he, uh, he was accused of uh, covering up or undermining an epidemic. Uh, what uh, we found out while taking a closer look at it is uh, a lot of African countries call this kind of uh, epidemic as acute watery diarrhea. Uh, in the teachings of WHO, we've seen pamphlets that show cholera equals uh, uh, acute or watery diarrhea, and, the, and the, the reason what they say is treatment equals the same. It's not like the treatment would have been changed uh, different. Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, lives that could have been saved would have uh, not uh, been; he, they wouldn't have been able to save. So that was not really the case. But in the face of this, he had uh, very uh, outspoken supporters as well. One of them is. Uh, Dr. Tom Frieden, who was the uh, head of the CDC, the U.S. CDC, uh, he came to uh, explain how it doesn't matter what the label was or uh, the fact that then, yeah, exactly it's what then. counts is what and also his experience yeah. also he and, yeah and if we talk, we just focus on that first his experience and yeah. because this was very political it's a campaign he actually set out some of his priorities so we want to hold him accountable to this exactly. if he's listening exactly. what were they. 
So he had five main visions. Uh, the first one is, of course, to transform the World Health Organization into a transparent organization agency. Um, he had other, uh, uh, you know, health for all, uh, security in terms of responding for, uh, on epidemics. WHO has a very bad record of responding to epidemics. A 2014 Ebola outbreak response was one of the most uh, criticized. Uh, they waited nine okay. months before declaring uh, we'll Ebola. We'll definitely crisis. be talking a, a lot more about Dr. Tedros and Dr. Tedros, you just pay attention. We'll be coming back to you. Uh, thanks a lot, Salim, thanks for, for joining me. us today. Uh, well, that's uh, VOA Digital journalist uh, Salim Solomon. Well, recent statistics show the murder of women in South Africa, or femicide, rate is five times higher than the global average. Now, two weeks ago, 22-year-old Karabo Mukena was physically abused and burned to death. A boyfriend has been charged for the killing in a case that triggered outrage. The incident has heightened conversations about violence against women in South Africa, and activists are calling on the government to address the killings and sexual abuse, which is also targeting children. Now, recently, South Africans demonstrated on the streets of Pretoria to protest, uh, protest violence against women and call on men to also fight for women's rights. Karabo's death spurred women on social media to share the personal stories of physical abuse. Karabo's anchor says her family hopes her death will help end the violence against women and force authorities to act. The biggest challenge in our country is that we talk, 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 and nothing happens. And six months down the line, what happens? There's another man who kills a woman. There's another man who um, assaults a woman. So now, what we must do as men, we must stand up and go to government and start changing certain laws. Whether we need to introduce more harsher laws or change the laws, this I think we must discuss. Yes. The crisis in the country, the manner in which women and children are being killed. Well, a 2016 statistics, South Africa's democratic, uh, demographic and health survey revealed that one in five South African women older than 18 experienced gender-based violence. Now, the report also found that four in 10 divorced or separated women reported physical violence by partners, as well as one in three women in the poorest households have faced that kind of violence. Now, we want to know uh, what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we covered during the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We are also streaming our show live on Facebook. So check us out and share our show with your friends also. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Coming up, a competition in Senegal aims to spar investment in science and math education. Stay with us. This is BizBeat. Something's got the $90 billion toy industry spinning out of control. It's called the Fidget Spinner. Now, one of the top selling toys around. Richard Gottlieb is the CEO of Global Toy Experts. It's one of those freaks of nature we see every once in a while where suddenly a toy out of nowhere suddenly takes on a life of its own. Typically held between your thumb and finger, it's nothing more than a tri-shape or similar object spinning on ball bearings. Kids love it, and because the patent expired, anybody can make them, but most come from China. Spinner that At Funky Monkey Toys, manager Nada Tim and I sells about 100 a day. We have uh, like all kind of customer, like parents, kids. Costing five to $15 typically, Attorney Kim Jusak has one. I'm naturally kind of fidgety, uh, and it, it, I, it does what it's designed for. Uh, it gives me something to do with my hands while I'm sitting kind of idle. And as one professor says, a lesson in angular momentum. From BOA's BizBeat, I'm Philip Alexia. Well, in Wednesday's business report, we are focusing on the 2018 U.S. proposed budget cuts and what it means for investment in Africa and the likelihood of it getting passed in Congress. Joining us from New York with the details is Africa 54 business correspondent Jill Malandrino. Hello, Jill. Hi. Um, so it, it looks as if uh, they're going to try and uh, balance the budget by 2027, and a lot of that is going to result from cuts um, 
overseas and Africa is going to be impacted by that. I wish I could say it won't, but unfortunately the continent is looking at cuts. The budget proposes to eliminate the African Development Foundation and the International American Foundation in order to streamline functions across the government. Now the funding included in the budget reflects closeout costs for ADF and IAF, particularly to pay severance costs. No additional federal funding will be needed in 2019 or beyond. So the eliminations reflect the administration's interest in maintaining overall discretionary fiscal discipline in a manner that emphasizes domestic needs over foreign assistance spending. Now, what country is going to pick up the slack here? Well, this is interesting. Ruben Brigadier, he's the dean of Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University, and he said the draconian cuts proposed to the State Department and foreign aid spending would force America to cede its interest in Africa, where the budget proposes to slash spending by close to 35 percent. He says we will, in effect, have gift wrapped the continent and handed it to China. And he said that to the House Foreign Affairs Committee last week. Now, how easy will it, will it be to pass this really massive cuts that everybody's been talking about? Well, the size and scope of the White House's proposed cuts could make it tough to swallow even among Republicans. The proposal includes, for example, changing the funding formula for Medicaid, which some GOP moderates and state governors have opposed. The budget assumes the White House will be able to dramatically lower taxes for households and businesses, but it's the steep cuts in the State Department that may prove to be big sources of contention. The Financial Times points out that the proposals are likely to encounter fierce resistance in Congress, particularly in the Senate, where the budget will need Democrats support to pass and from also Pentagon officials who see diplomacy as vital to America's national security. We definitely will be watching this. Jill, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, that's uh, VOA's uh, Africa 54 business correspondent Jill Malandrino reporting from New York. Now in West Africa, several hundred middle school and high school students from Senegal and the surrounding countries spent last week in Dakar building robots. Organizers of the annual robotics competition say the goal is to encourage African governments and private donors to invest more in science and math education throughout the continent. Ricky Shryok has our report. These small robots and the students driving them are competing to gather mock natural resources like diamonds and gold. The robots were built by teams of young people gathered in Dakar for the annual Pan-African Robotics Competition. This year's theme is Made in Africa and focuses on how robotics could help local economies. Uh, we've noticed that uh, most, people, most countries that have developed uh, in the, the likes of the United States uh, have based their development on manufacturing and industrialization. And African countries, on the other hand, are left behind in this uh, race. And so we thought it would be a good idea to inspire the kids to tell them about uh, the importance of manufacturing, the importance of industry, and the importance of creation and product development. During the week, the students were split into three groups. The first group worked on robots that could automate warehouses. The second created machines that could mine resources. And the third group was tasked to come up with a new African product and describe how they would build it. 17-year-old Mariam Toure and her team built a robot that would be able to work in mines. This helps us get more involved in science. Learning to program robots allows us to develop a certain aptitude in robotics that will serve us in the future. Competing against Touré is Usman Lo, also of Senegal. He says robots could solve problems in Africa, in particular in agriculture. We have made this formation to be able to do this if we have difficulties in agriculture. A winning team was named in each category, but Endow hopes the real winner will be science and math education in Africa. The ideal is that we will have African university that have standard similar or perhaps better standard than European and American university, so that the students who are thousands or the millions of them in uh, Africa have the chance to have a higher stand of the state of the art education in the continent. If this is what the students could do with just one week of instruction, imagine what they could do with more. Ricky Shryock for VOA News, Dakar. Well, it's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54. Everything old is new again at Nokia's latest launch. We'll be right back. If you've just joined us, I'm Mariama Diallo, and here is a quick recap of today's headlines. 
U.S. Ambassador to Libya pledges Washington's support for Libya's U.N.-backed government during his brief visit to the country, the first in nearly three years. In Ivory Coast, three demobilized ex-rebel fighters are killed in Boaké on Tuesday as they clashed with police in a protest over the end of the fighters' bonus payments. In South Africa, hundreds marched through the capital, Pretoria, to demonstrate against rising attacks on women and children. Finally, in Tunisia, thousands attend the funeral of a protester killed during clashes in the south. That's all for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending, and it's a completely classic look. Pippa Middleton arrived at her wedding with a simply cut dress and makeup uh, looking natural with her sister, the Duchess of Cambridge, in a tailored pale pink dress and matching hat. But international makeup artists say most brides this year are being encouraged to, uh, to ditch the conservative look for something more outside the box. An international makeup artist trade show in London, the eyes are bald and smoky and the face shaded and contoured. According to artists here, most brides aren't picking their ideas from traditional sources anymore. Instead, they are going to Instagram for looks that come from every part of the globe. Well, next up, what's the most important piece of Californian design? Well, the iPhone or Facebook might be high-profile examples, but scratch beneath the surface in Californian design and culture uh, permeates all our lives. And next ex uh, a new exhibition in London is celebrating the best of Californian design at London's Design Museum. Californian design really began to attract attention when hippie com communes of the 1960s started to spring up in California, looking to create a different way of living to the mainstream. Now, the bottom line, California design is all about progress and personal freedom, from Apple computers to hippie beads to biker chic. Well, and finally, rewind the clocks 17 years, and the Nokia 3310 was the undisputed star of mobile phones. It was cool, it was hot, and it was small. Crucial factors in those days. It's now making a triumphant return to the phone market after being unveiled at a Mobile World Congress technology show in Barcelona. Now, this new Nokia 3310 has been produced by HMD Global. There's a small Finland-based startup that purchased the rights to produce Nokia phones. Just like the original device, the 3310 has a simplicity and long battery life at its core. Now, the price is affordable at 49 euros. The Nokia 3310 only operates on 2G networks, meaning that it will only have the most basic of internet connections. And that is what is trending today, and that's our show for today. Now, be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com for more news. Tune in to VOA's evening radio show Africa News tonight at 1800 UTC, and in the mornings to Daybreak Africa. That's between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us in Washington, have a good night. Welcome to English in a Minute. We always hope for the best possible result or outcome. But what is the best way to use this expression? Best of both worlds. How do you like biking to work? Oh, I love it. It's fun and I actually get to work faster. Wow, it seems like biking is the best of both worlds. It's fun and in 